There are real life vampires, modern day living amongst us, vampire culture and vampire communities. My next guest on this show is John Edgar Browning. He has a doctorate from Sunny Buffalo and currently teaches liberal arts at the College of Art and Design in uh, Atlanta. He has studied modern vampire culture uh, for years. So today we're going to uh, pick his brain about the modern vampire culture, its roots, the roots of vampire and vampirism, and uh, everything from the silly questions like, do they sleep in coffins? Do they age? Uh, how does holy water affect them? To some of the more serious questions about how they uh, consume, how they find donors for blood consumption. And we may actually, at some point in time, touch on the dark side of this and how it ties into the occult. So tune in for an enlightening discussion with John. Quite frankly, it's kind of unusual. It's quite, quite Franklin. Quite fr- <laughs> Got it. Quite Franklin. Do you remember how old you were when you watched your first horror movie? Uh, you know, no, but I think about this a lot because I watch documentaries all the time where, you know, big sc- scholars like myself and, and filmmakers talk about the first time they saw particular movies. And I don't have recollections like that because I was watching them so early in life. Uh, but the only one I can remember distinctly, distinctly was when my m- m- parents took my brothers and me to the drive-in theater. This had to be about 1986. And um, I would have been kindergarten going into first grade. Anyway, we, we saw a double bill with, uh, which you'll get a kick out of. Uh, the, the first movie was Texas Chainsaw Massacre, yeah. part two. <laughs> and uh, the American uh, American Ninja. Oh, wow. Okay. With Michael Dudikoff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's probably been since almost 1986 since I've seen that movie, actually. That's, it was a double bill. <laughs> I, I remember the first movie, the first horror movie that I watched as a kid. My parents also took me to a drive-in theater, and we saw uh, Death Ship. That, that must have yes. been like yeah. 78, 79, I'm guessing. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I was a little kid and that I remember, I just remember that scaring me to death. But the first movie I can remember watching that, like I basically made the, the, the cognizant choice of watching the movie and it scaring me to death was the shining. Okay. Oh man. That, oh, yeah. that, that movie did me in, but, uh, but yeah. So, um, yeah, but you know, my brother, like my brother, he introduced his kid, um, to horror movies. Like my nephew was fascinated with Michael Myers at like the age of, three or four or something like that. They, you know, just fascinating. Yeah. And, and introduced that to, uh, to him at a very young age. This obviously grew into a, a profession for you. And then in your studies, cause you, you attended Georgia tech. Yeah. Correct. Uh, no, I, I taught at Georgia tech for five years and then now I teach at SCAD Atlanta. Where did you earn your uh, doctorate though? I just finished the coursework for a PhD in English at LSU, Louisiana state university. And then before I did my dissertation, I transferred up North to SUNY Buffalo. Um, University at Buffalo SUNY, and that was American Studies. Was your dissertation on this topic then? Because you've written so many essays on like the topic right. of gothic stuff and horror films and Dracula right. and all that kind of stuff. My dissertation was on vampires. It looked at uh, basically the evolution of a particular kind of um, vampiric figure and its characterization that we take for granted now, which is this vampire that's very amiable, <clears throat> um, not so much as sympathetic anymore as they're usually the good guy until we see otherwise. And that's the, that's the case with a lot of horror movies, a lot of monsters. Monsters today, in, the, in most cases, are they're good guys until proven guilty, not guilty until proven innocent. They're, um, it's the other way around now. So we look at monsters today as being more like heroic figures and guys. And then we find out that they're bad. Like, okay, well, they're the bad kind of monster, not the good kind. But vampires have been that way too for the last 20 years. But my dissertation looks at how there was this step-by-step slow evolution to becoming You did a study uh, on modern vampire, vampirism or vampire culture, I guess you could say. So before, because there are people in this world who uh, practice or claim to be, or I mean, I don't even know how to properly say that, like that are practicing vampires or claim to be vampires or whatever, uh, in, in modern society. And you've actually, you've, you've traveled. I, I saw a bit on you in New Orleans. Uh, you've done some, obviously some studies in Buffalo since you studied there as well. These va- vampire cultures. Now 
are they all over the U.S., or, for example, or do they just kind of congregate in certain certain areas? Well, you can find uh, the terms we use are kind of interchangeable. Uh, are the uh, real vampire community or human vampire community or modern vampire community? And you'll find these small separate communities all over the United States, as well as essentially all over the world, everywhere from, I imagine, in various parts of, of Asia, Russia, England, Australia, South Africa, Canada, South America, you name it. And like, are these, are these, are, are, like, are these communities, are they inter interconnected? I mean, particularly now with the, with the internet and stuff like that, the, are, are they well aware of each other? I mean, if I was in the vampire community in New Orleans, for example, and I decided that I wanted to travel to Argentina for a week, would I connect into the vampire community in Argentina? And how easy, how accessible is that for these people? For them, it's a little easier than for it is for outsiders. They have various kinds of networks that they can use online that aren't, you know, accessible to people that aren't a part of that community. But also, even if they <clears throat> couldn't find access, there are ways to kind of research if you know what to look for to kind of find these communities. And actually, it's a pretty common practice if you are a real vampire living in New Orleans and you plan to visit New York City or something, you might let one of the elders there know or someone who has been uh, um, an open human vampire empire for a while let them know that you're coming and just sort of and, and do so in two ways to say hey i'm coming where should i meet up or what where should i go and also just to say i'm coming not really asking permission to go there but just to say i'll be in the area and it's kind of a, an etiquette that is used by uh, members of the real vampire community here in the u.s just for the listeners let's get to uh the silly questions all right the, you know, all, all the obvious ones um, vampires do they age so human vampires or real vampires i'll go back and forth saying that all the time um, they are people who generally just after puberty begin feeling sluggish and lethargic and unable to stay energized. And, you know, despite the fact that they exercise or eat healthily, take vitamins, doesn't matter. They always feel sluggish. And again, this, this starts just after puberty. If you talk to any of them, um, and eventually they come in contact often by accident, they come in contact with human blood or animal blood. Or they just find that they like giving their friends like massages or something if they're a psychic vampire. And uh, basically, when they realize that if they consume blood or take energy, although for psychic vampires, they're less, less cognizant of that, what they're doing, um, they feel great. They don't feel like super powerful. You know, they don't feel supernatural or above other people. They just feel normal in terms of their energy level. And they just continue taking blood if they can, either because of friend lets them have it or maybe they might buy some meat or their parents have some meat that has some blunt liquid in the package who knows um and then later on they learn that there are other people just like them and they have adopted this um this term as a way of kind of self-identifying or communicating this identity of theirs which is a vampire and that's why they say real vampire or human vampire as a way of distinguishing it from the supernatural or folkloric or, you know, the fictional vampire. Are, are, is real vampire and human vampire interchangeable? Yes, yes, okay. yes. I, I didn't know if there was maybe like some sort of nuance between the two or, or whatever. No, no, okay. it's the same thing. Uh, human, real or modern vampire is the same thing. It just, it's the, the, the term has been used interchangeably and has changed just because it's trying to help other people understand that they're not, they don't think that they are a vampire like the supernatural vampire. They're, they've simply used the word vampire as a way of, of, of communicating this identity of theirs. Okay. They could have chose a lot of other different words. Um, in fact, they probably would have gotten much less flack if they had, but it makes sense to me and it does to them and it did to them at the time that vampire would make the most sense. But um, they don't feel like they live forever. They don't feel like they have really any supernatural powers at all. They just have this need uh, to feel healthy, uh, to drink blood or, you know, human blood, animal blood, or take psychic energy. So it, it doesn't matter to them whether it's human blood or animal blood. For some, it's a preference. For some, they feel like they can take more energy or feel better after, for example, animal blood. <clears throat> for some, they feel like uh, animal blood is better because they're not going out and killing animals, for Christ's sake. But they, they can go to specialty butcher shops uh, where it doesn't look strange for them to be getting blood. Um, or they have other means of getting blood. And um, sometimes they prefer that because 
well, these animals, they don't kiss and tell, you know, with human donors, which are very secretive, um, they can still talk or something like that. But some of them are they're just very, very secretive. And if you go after animal blood, you know, no one's going to blab. So to speak. Well, the two questions here, I'll ask my first one it is for people that, that claim to be uh, human vampires, real vampires, are they, is there like physiologically something that's deficient with them? That's actually measurable on a, on a test, like on a blood test that's uh, that shows like, Oh, they have like iron deficiencies or something like that, where consuming blood, it really helps them. Well, I'll tell you this in two ways. I, I wish, and they wish that there was that they could find something and many of them you know growing up and even later into their adulthood have gone to the doctor to to get tested to find some kind of or do some kind of blood work to find if there's some deficiency and and generally there's not anything that that can be pinpointed that would cause this um in fact initially when i before going into this i assumed this whole thing must be you know psychosomatic like you know they they like vampires or they they, they like watching vampire movies or reading vampire books and so they think if i take blood yeah almost like like a cosplay or something like that yeah like it, do the blood that makes them better and it, it's it's rare that i find meet with a, um, a human vampire or, or real vampire that um who uh is very knowledgeable about vampire lore and books and comics and movies and stuff like that i figured going into my first study 11 years ago that i was going to meet people just like me who maybe just had gone a step further and <laughs> drink blood now and it wasn't the case at all um they they know about as much about vampires as just the average person which really fascinated me because it means they weren't taking on this name or this word vampire to to you know fulfill this need they have to to stand out and, and and you know embrace vampire culture it was just a word that, that fit best to communicate what they're going through and so at that point i realized it's probably not psychosomatic and then when i would learn enough about each of them and find that it was blood they came in contact with by accident or psychic energy um there were just all these different cues that told me that it, it wasn't psychosomatic so they weren't just thinking they need the blood and then taking the blood it makes them feel better almost like a placebo um it wasn't the case i mean then when it comes to like blood consumption you know you can if you consume too much blood and it can actually be uh counterproductive to a healthy body i mean right. it, can, it can cause right. like health issues you know like iron buildup for the, for that matter and so right you know, how how do they deal with that like how much blood does a, a human vampire consume um, you know, how, like, is there a ratio? Like, do they try to consume a certain amount of animal blood to human blood? Is, does it matter? Um, they actually consume very little in the grand scheme of things. They certainly don't consume enough to where they can get, you know, iron poisoning or, or whatnot. Um, I think for some of them in one sitting, you know, the most amount of blood they might take is probably about the same, if not less than when someone has, you know, a, a bad nosebleed. If actually a bad nosebleed is probably considerably more blood than that might, they might take in one sitting and they might only feed um, once a week. Some of them twice a week, some of them might feed every day, but the amount of blood they take is not nearly the amount that would make them sick. Why not eat like a rare cooked steak or a raw steak for that matter? And some of them do. Uh, some of them do um, that, that they find uh, at least the ones that I've interviewed and from the literature that I've read. Um, some of them do that, uh, but it's usually not as uh, it, it doesn't provide them with as much energy and, and the kind of nourishment they're looking for as much as if they were to go to a specialty butcher shop and just purchase, you know, a pint or something like that of animal blood. I can't imagine if I walked into the butcher near my house and said, hey, I'm like, can I get a, a pound of ground beef? Um, but also, can I get a pint of blood? He would be like, yeah. What? Yeah, it's uh, definitely they, they tend to go to specialty butcher shops and in, in major cities where you'll find substantial communities often. Um, they'll, they'll have butcher shops like that, especially butcher shops that cater to um, cultures outside of the kind of basic domestic American culture. And I mean, in fact, other other cultures, other countries have a lot of various blood based dishes. There are several uh colleague faculty colleague up north was just telling me where he's from in malaysia there are several blood 
base dishes. Yeah, there's 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 a couple out of the Philippines and stuff like that as well. And so it doesn't look, or if you're from uh, Scandinavia, even that there are blood based dishes. So um, there are lots of butcher, butcher shops that will cater to those kinds of things because they realize there's different tastes for different people in different cultures. So depending on which shop they go to, it doesn't look as outlandish as it might. Although if they went to a, a shop and you know, homegrown, red-blooded American little town, it probably would turn some heads, yeah. But yeah, they yeah. wouldn't be living there anyway. In Cincinnati, Ohio, it might, uh, it might, somebody might scratch a head like, huh, what? You know, so. Yeah, yes, for sure, for sure. But I, I would imagine in, in a place like uh, just outside of Cincinnati, if you were, if you were a, a human vampire and you also happen to be a hunter, you could probably take care of most of your, your blood needs. But it seems to me, uh, I mean, logic would have it that if I just – if, if I was just eating like raw meat, I would, I should be able to consume. Like I would think that because I saw the little, the stint with you on the history channel with um, mm -hmm. the, the gentleman from New Orleans, Bal Balfasar, is that, was that yeah. his name? Yeah. And yeah. like when he, he pricked your back, there wasn't I, the, I mean, I was like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm completely interested. Like I'm like, all right, how's this mm -hmm. going to go down? And then I, right. I love the way that he, like, <laughs> I'll, I'll poke fun a little bit here. It was very sanitary with the alcohol wipes. Mm -hmm only to then uh, take his dirty mouth and stick it on, on the wound of your back. Right. So, you know, there's yeah. a, a little bit of, a little bit of irony to that, but um, the amount of blood that he consumed, I thought, man, if I just ate a raw or a rare, like a rare steak, if I liked my steak, just rare or even medium rare, I'm probably consuming more blood than that. Um, so I didn't know if like, you know, was, um, yeah. When you're talking about things being psychosomatic or whatever, I'm like, interesting. I don't remember even, I even watched that full, uh, scene uh, from that particular episode only because I hate seeing myself on TV. Like I sound like a moron and look like a moron, but they did film him going into the bathroom and brushing his teeth and sanitizing it and using mouthwash, all these other particular precautions he takes. Um, and then whenever he was doing the amount of blood he took, that was just to demonstrate how he feeds. He, it, he didn't take the amount of blood he would normally take uh, for, uh, for a more, you know, um, personal setting and personal encounter with one of his donors so that was essentially just to show how it's done and just to show where he takes it from and where it creates fewer scars and whatnot um but you're right it, it, some real vampires if they don't have access to their donors because they're on vacation or just because maybe the donor left um they will resort to just eating you know extremely rare steak or or doing some other way that can sort of help with the cravings but uh if you ask them to choose where they find themselves getting the most direct energy and vitality, it would be just finding blood because even the blood inside a rare steak is, is more or less more like blood tainted liquid um, and yeah. other kinds of, of juices. So it's, it's not as pure as they would find in straightforward blood. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. All right. Then let's actually take, take a step back, like literally take a step back in history, even though, you know, you're saying there's, there's not a ton of connection here, like with, at least with the modern day uh, vampire culture and that of Dracula and so, so to speak, but like looking at the origins of uh, human blood consumption, because this exists in nearly every, um, historic, like, like if you're looking at like Persian societies, Greek societies and stuff like that, can you, can you talk a little bit about the origins of this kind of practice? Well, it's the idea of, of consuming someone's blood or even consuming their flesh is, has been, uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's been, it's been a, a means by different cultures to accomplish different things for some cultures consuming, a uh, part of one of their beloved elders who's passed away was a way of retaining some of them for themselves and almost as a way of honoring them. Not all of the body they're eating, but parts, just small parts of the body as a way of retaining some of them. For other cultures, and especially cultures that were more militaristic, um, consuming the, the flesh or blood of some great warrior might allow you to take in some of their own essence to make you a better warrior or a better fighter. Um, and then for some cultures, it might boil down to the, the the greatest insult you can do after you if you do kill them is to also eat part of them and so it just really depends on what it is the the particular culture is trying to accomplish but certainly as you pointed out you'll see historical texts that describe the the practice of consuming someone's uh, flesh or taking their blood so you know before um, before the the modern day dracula was created i mean there was this fear of like of um i don't know 
I, I mean, I use the word vampire, but uh, the, at that point in time, vampire, that word didn't really exist. But like even in medieval times and all that kind of stuff, like there was the fear of this, of like these creatures and whatnot that would consume that would consume blood. Like even, you know, if you're looking at like different cultures, like in the, in the Hebrew culture, there, there's the, the Lilith, for example, which is a, a female demon that comes at night and can, can consume blood. So these, these kinds of things um, existed. So how, like, how does that, how, how did that kind of like shape culture and all that kind of stuff? Like, because there, there's these fear, there was this fear that existed way before this modern invention mm. of the, uh, the, the modern day vampire of Dracula right. and all that kind of stuff. Right, but you have these figures that we would recognize as vampire-like or vampiric figures without having the actual word vampire. Exactly. A lot of it probably rests in the the importance placed on blood. People made very general assumptions, but very smart assumptions, I think, uh, about blood and its power. If if someone were cut and blood is coming out, that person dies. So there must be some importance with this blood. They they didn't make the I mean, they're not going to know that it's carrying oxygen around the body, you know, for for millennia later, you know, to the last hundred and twenty years or something like that. Um, but they knew that there was something very important with this red stuff inside of us, and you know, it made sense that if you could put that blood back in, then it would bring life back in to that person or to that body. And it also didn't help that if People believed in, in creatures that we would call vampires, and they might exhume them, their body, and find that this body that had looked a certain way and been placed in the grave a certain way, and then they dig it up, and it's got all these new different features that they didn't know happens just because they don't understand decomposition, nor would they even be privy to a body going through decomposition. It's something that, you know, the moment someone dies, you depending on the culture, you give the, the, the soul time enough to leave and then you put it in the ground before, you know, little or no decomposition has started that you can visually see other, other you know, basically it's happening inside, but you can't see that part, but they dig up the body and suddenly the body that was skinny is now plump. Okay. It's swollen and they see blood flowing from the eyes, nose, mouth, ears. And they're thinking, Okay, so we have a vampire because it's gotten big, almost like a tick from taking all this energy and blood. And it, it would take more than just blood. It might just take the energy. It might even come back and sex somebody to death, particularly the, the, the widow or family members. In fact, this is why we believe that, the, that to this day, why widows will wear black veils. We, today it's to show your mourning, but it used to be to protect them or hide them <laughs> at the funeral from the husband <clears throat> who might come back as a vampire because generally the first person he would come back for is going to be the wife. And anyway, there are other signs too of these bodies with the, the, uh, the nails might appear to be longer. There might be a five o'clock shadow now. The body might be a different position in the grave. The eyes and mouth might be open, whereas they weren't before. Um, there might even be the appearance of an erection if it's a male. Uh, and that also added to this idea of the vampire having a voracious appetite, both for life and wanting blood or energy or just wanting sex. All of this, of course, is natural bodily process when the body is decomposing. It's the methane gas that's blowing up the body, okay, and giving the, the, the what was previously a white pale face, now giving it a ruddy or red swollen look. And the blood is, of course, the, the gas is pushing out, it's forcing out all these different blood tainted liquids from different orifices. And uh, it also is inflating the um, the sexual member of the male body. So but they didn't know that. And then they go and stake the body. And of course, when that happens, uh, the body moans, which completely convinced them they had made the right decision. And of course, it's just them pushing the methane gas over the voice box creating noise. So all those things convinced them that something was a vampire. But they even then knew that if this thing is trying to stay alive and it's taking this thing that's blood, we know that blood is important. What was the, what was the origin, I guess, of where our modern day vampire tale kind of came from? Is there, I mean, I know it's hard to pin down. Uh, I know like I, I was re actually, when I was doing research for this, I was, I was actually reading about um, someone by the name of Ambrosio, which a, a lot of people often like check off as like false uh, history. I don't know if you know that tale or whatever, um, but a lot of people attribute obviously uh, Dracula to like v Vlad the Impaler, um, 
so like where like where is the origins of this this modern day vampire best that you can obviously because your research is a lot deeper that you could nail that mm -hmm. down to well the from what we know i'll start with dracula and move on to where we get our modern conception uh, but i'll start with dracula when it comes to vlad the impaler we have no direct evidence uh, from what we have in terms of Bram Stoker's working notes for the novel uh, and what he put in the novel, we have no evidence that shows he knew anything more about Dracula than that he was a <clears throat> ruler during a particular time in what we now know today as Romania or call today Romania, and that his name meant a devil or or dragon actually we don't even think he knew dragon just that it meant devil and that it was became became a, a name given to anyone who was of great cunning courage or even just evil uh kind of potential for doing evil things and that's about it you would think it was just like a, a god sent for him to find all this information about vlad the impaler uh but he, we, we don't even think he knew that his name was vlad so um, the Vlad the Impaler is something very distinct from Stoker's conception of Dracula. In fact, from his notes, it looks like he was taking information about not just Dracula, but also one of Dracula's brothers and whatnot, kind of combined it into this composite. So essentially, it was just what we think is really good luck that Stoker picked him, not knowing that this name and persona he picked actually has this whole other history which matches up perfectly with count dracula's behavior in the novel so it was pure chance at that point um but dracula as a character and that kind of modern conception of the vampire really started with a tale published around 1819 or in 1919 called the vampire by a fellow named john william polidori and he was the traveling physician of lord byron and eventually lord byron sacked him but before he did that, uh, Polidori was with Lord Byron and Percy Bysshe Shelley, the famous poet at the time, like Byron. And Percy Bysshe Shelley was with what would, I guess, be his future wife, Mary Godwin, or Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, and she would become Mary Shelley. And they were having um, a contest to see who could write the best ghost story or horror story because there was really, really bad weather during that time and they had to stay indoors. And so Byron wrote, what would be called a fragment of a novel about a vampire. Percy Bysshe Shelley, I think, wrote something to do with the Gollum figure. And then, of course, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. And uh, Byron thought nothing of his fragment. He tossed it aside, I guess. And then whenever um, Polidori was fired, he would take that fragment and expand it greatly to the point where there's really not a whole lot left, in my opinion, of Byron's story in Polidori's but it definitely was adapted from it and expanded. So Polidori published that um, unsigned and the publisher read it, uh, the, the pure article he submitted it to and assumed from the, potentially from the writing style and the topic that it must be Lord Byron. So they actually put Lord Byron's name on it, which really pissed him off and it destroyed Polidori's reputation. In fact, he would eventually commit suicide a few years later. But I digress. The whole point, though, is that that story, uh, which is written by someone who was fairly disgruntled by his employer, Lord Byron, um, that was the first story that really said, let's leave behind this folkloric vampire, which is a, essentially a, a, a villager, a peasant, or someone who is probably walking around in a death shroud or you know death skirt or something like that. Um, and who is not of you know nobility, who is not an aristocrat, is not great to look at, you know, and also is going through these phases of decomposition, making them something more akin to a zombie or a fresh zombie than something you find in a vampire novel. But his vampire was this who had someone who had the essentially the look and behavior of Lord Byron, because he was really giving him the bird, but also expressing how much he desired Lord Byron, because there was um, the sexuality there was very fluid between the two. And yeah, he created this character where he was, his behavior was scary, but he was also beautiful. And he was taking women and ruining their reputations and also vampirizing women and also doing stuff to the, uh, the narrator who was male that um, people found morally reprehensible, but still you read this novel, the story 
thinking you wanted to be in the shoes of this narrator. So after that, that's what really gave the vampire this new kind of persona where you could actually have them where they can walk into society, walk into someone's salon and drink among nobility and go around while doing these crazy things behind the scenes. So that began the whole evolution of the vampire that we know it today. Gotcha. Okay. So going back to uh, the blood then, because I'm, I'm like, I'm thinking about this whole blood thing in, well, let me, let me sidetrack on that. You, in interviewing some of these vampires, uh, no pun intended on the movie title, but in interviewing a lot of the vampires that you work with, you like you. One of the comments that you made was that you've met vampires that are monotheistic, polytheistic, atheistic, like all all different religions. Talk talk to me about that, like th that experience and and like the different beliefs that you've come across with this thing. Right. Well, it's definitely across all across the board. Um, th there wasn't a lot that I could find that really tied them all together in a in a organized way except the fact they all had this need uh physiological need according to them for blood or energy but otherwise the ages ranged from late teens early 20s up into the 50s the sex was about equal with with the the human vampire community the ones that i was with uh there might have been slightly more females on you know on a good day but it was generally about equal um, the only thing that I found that was not particular about that, but that community was that um, it was mostly Caucasian, although there was uh, one Latina, but there were others that weren't attending any of the meetings or going to the places I would go uh, that I could not see that might be some other ethnic group besides being white. But, but if you go, to, for example, to New York City, you'll find there are a lot more um, uh, people of color there who who are part of the food community. So it really depends on which community you're talking to and going to. But point being here is there was no way that I could really say all of them are doing all these things and they fit this one mold. They're all over the board. The only thing that really ties them together is this same origin story, which is what mainly convinced me when I would interview them separately. And they all talked about this thing that started kind of after puberty. And it wasn't like they'd all talked and Put, got their story straight before I got there. You know, they all had very, very different stories with a very similar or identical origin. And if when I compare that to the kinds of books I have that, that are based on research and personal narratives from people from the early 70s, when we first started documenting this, they had the same stories. And these books are very rare that I have. And these vampires haven't read any of them. So it was that is what in addition to the other areas, convinced me that they weren't just, you know, telling me this story they heard somewhere. I heard you say about, yeah, there's no real sexual orientation that that commonly binds everybody together. Like, is, there's no real orientation to this. But when I was when I heard you talk about like the the religion of people or the you know the practices of faith or whatever, then I started thinking about like my my mind obviously connects to like being Christian. I automatically start connecting. Like, there's a there's this whole dark side to blood. Right. I mean, um, coven witches, you know, uh, blood magic, all this kind of different stuff, Santeria, voodoo, and mm -hmm. all this stuff ties in. Um, like, have you had any crossover with that, that kind of stuff uh, as it relates to th these kind of vampire communities? Like just whether they're related or not related, maybe they can be mutually exclusive or it, but just come across it in your studies or and right. if so, what's the overlap? Well, the uh, I can only speak for the ones that I've interviewed or communicated with, but there are also there's uh, some studies that show where people can self-identify what their particular uh, religious or faith was. But with the ones I've interviewed, um, you were less likely to find Christianity or maybe Christianity combined with something else, which is basically what Voodoo is. Um, you were more likely to find non-Christian uh, religious faiths. So you might find something that deals with the uh, with witchcraft or Wicca. Uh, others you might find voodoo. Uh, you might find others where it's um, definitely more on the metaphysical side. Um, and I think, from my perspective, just on um, you know just at the surface, I assumed it was because those particular kinds of religions were um, more accepting of the idea and the power of blood. And we're just more open to people being able to do stuff with blood, because I imagine if you're a Christian, there's a whole lot going on in the Bible that's like the only blood you should be drinking 
is when, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Jesus when you, yeah, yeah. in the Catholic church, when it's changed or transubstantiation, when it's changed over and, you know, from, from uh, wine to blood or something like that. But yeah, um, basically what I'm saying is I found very, very few, if any Christians among the group. Yeah. And I think that is, is I have to look at this study that studies several thousands, but, um, and I can't recall off the top of my head, but if I had to guess and I go back and look, it would find that the, the, the one of the smallest portions would be Christianity. That's where my head, my, my mind drifts off. Obviously I'm, 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 I'm a Christian. And so when I think about that, like they're very, like the very, the Bible's very clear and strict about like how to deal with blood, particularly even in the old Testament, like the Levitical law at the time, there were, there were practices when you were sacrificing an animal to God on an altar of, you know, different kind of blood sacrifices and burnt offerings and things like that. But you were like, you were strictly forbidden to consume the blood. And then obviously, you know, as Christianity moves on and then Jesus Christ comes down as the ultimate sacrifice, then you're pretty much finished with the blood, except for obviously when you're taking right. communion. And right. so I was like really curious about that kind of stuff because when I, I was, I was watching one of the, one of the pieces on you about, uh, just, I don't know, like one of the pieces on national geographic or whatever it was. And it was the, the next yeah. one that followed, because it seems like within this, the vampire community, at least the bulk of the people that you've studied, uh, I would kind of classify them as quote unquote, I'll do this with my fingers, um, mm -hmm. friendly vampires in that the participants are willing participants, but they're like the, the video following yours, I don't know if it was a learning channel or whatever, but it was uh, following a police officer who followed up a call on a girl who was abducted and a guy who claimed to be a mm -hmm. vampire and held her captive and stuff like that. So in, in your studies of this kind of stuff, um, because as I was reading it, like, you know, initially if you were to, on the surface, uh, think about this topic like people like people identify vampires, and that's like that's why I said early on like let's get the silly questions out of the way. Mm -hmm. How does silver affect them? Yeah, they can spend it just like right. everybody else. What about garlic? Yeah. They, they taste delicious to them. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, so it's like haha, this is kind of funny, but w w there there could be this entire dark side to it. And have you come across that with like a vampire, like within the vampire culture where there is like this this sect of or group of people that practice a more sinister version of this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I won't say yes, but uh, it's a really, really great question. And often people will conflate the two uh, when they watch programs like what you described, where, you know, you're we're talking to a friendly vampire and then I've never met a human vampire that was not friendly. And it's, it's extremely rare if you find one that is not uh, if they want to be found, they don't really want to be found generally because people aren't going to understand them and they'll be ridiculed. But when you have, <clears throat> excuse me, programs where you have this friendly vampire, then right afterwards you have a case where someone's talking about how they were kidnapped, and it's probably the Florida case that you're speaking of, um, where the, the yeah, where he, she was kidnapped and he tied her up and he was taking her blood through various kinds of syringes and stuff. Um, but he, she left and he was caught, but people will think, well, there must be just as many of those. And those are just like the outlier. There's, those are so, so rare. And generally there is a lot of, there's more psychopathy connected with them. Um, they actually think that they're a supernatural vampire or something like that. Or if they think that they need blood or want blood, it's something that happens later on in life, or it's also associated with wanting blood because it does something else for them and they want to have the power of being a vampire. So um, I think psychologists would say that something, a lot more is going on with them than what we might find with human vampires. Uh, but when they have programs like that, they don't really make that distinction. And people will unfortunately think that if, you know, for every two friendlies, there must be four bad guys or something like that. And, and it's not the case, but in the real vampire community, there are, um, very, very, very small portions that are even more secretive that like to, I think, place go beyond just wanting blood because they need it to feel just normal, but also adding more importance and and power to this idea that they are something more. And it's it's all about the, the, the human need to make us feel like we're something more to kind of legitimate our being on earth and legitimate our genes that we give to people. It's something more. And uh, there is one group. It's not, it's not really part of the human vampire community, but it's kind of placed with it in connection. This is called the, the temple of the vampire. And they certainly believe that there is more to them than what is 
going on with others and that they have certain powers and that people are here for them to sort of be as, as cattle. Um, I have written a piece on them before, but I don't get into them much because they're very different from the human vampire community. But if you did enough research, what I'm getting at here is that you'll find smaller groups that overlap only with some distinct behaviors, but they're very separate from and not really part of the community that I study. Well, you know, what, actually, I, that, I mean, that makes sense to me when, when you talk about that kind of stuff. Like if we were to use the phrase fin- friendly vampires only because it's like anything else, uh, they're radicalists in any kind mm-hmm. of group. If you want to kind of phrase it that way, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, it only takes a, a few r- religious radicalists right. to create a uh, fear I mean, a la, you know, yeah. uh, two, circa 2001 uh, in the United States, right? I mean, at that point in time, everybody was afraid of, of Muslims and, and right. everybody in Islam was just evil yeah. uh, at that point. Which was l- ludicrous, but you're right. One a small group did something and everyone conflates the whole group with that. And it's, it's terrible when that happens because it, it, it leads people thinking that they're all like that and they have to be afraid of all of them. And, and you're right. You, you have to, it sounds odd saying a friendly vampire because that, that word vampire by nature should be something that's not friendly. I've always told them that it's, I think they chose the best term, but it's almost unfortunate for people outside the community that they use that term because it gives a very different kind of perception yeah, they, they should have hired somebody in marketing for that, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but again, even if I were them, it makes the most sense because of what vampires need. But also, it's a very kind of post-late 60s conception that vampires are misunderstood and that they probably don't like what they're going through. It's a very, very, very late 60s, early 70s thing, which is about the time we start seeing people coming out of the coffin. In fact, they were going to dark shadows conventions and BDSM conventions to just because they like those, those venues, but also they discovered there are other people there like them. And they also found there were people there who were, who were blood fetishists, which is not a real vampire, but blood fetishists like having their blood taken because it turns them on. And of course that means that person could be a, a willing donor for their, their vampire's blood. So all that stuff started then. Um, but it's the use of that term that always is kind of a misnomer for what they are. Talking about blood and taking in blood and it giving you energy and stuff like that. Well, uh, you know, when you said that some people have a fetish with actually don't like giving blood for this kind of thing, then I'm assuming that kind of within the vampire community, it's not as if a vampire needs to be with another vampire as far as like marriage goes or something. Like you, that. You, you will find that um, not infrequently. Uh, I think only because it's like being with someone who understands you better than other people would understand you, if that makes sense. In other words, it's uh, they don't have to be with another vampire in a relationship. And you'll find many, many, many relationships where it's not the case, but the husband or wife or girlfriend or boyfriend will understand what their partner is going through. And they, they definitely are okay with it. Uh, for some, it, it makes sense to be with someone who's not a vampire because if they need blood or energy, they can just keep getting it from their partner who is usually completely willing to do that. But like I said, other relationships, it makes sense to be with another vampire just because you both know what's going on. You don't have to convince them that what they're doing is, is not weird. You know what I'm saying? You're, they're both on the same page. Um, they won't necessarily take blood from each other because they probably would think that there's not the right kind of energy in that blood because they too are a vampire. In other words, they both have the same deficiency. So drinking from them would usually mean you're not getting anything out of it or very little out of it. Okay. So if about that blood, then, then, uh, you know, one of the, one of the terms that was popularized, uh, as of recent, particularly with all the talk of pedophilia and stuff like that Mm -hmm. was uh, adrenochrome. Are you familiar with this term? I've only heard, I mean, I've, I've briefly passed over it. Um, in fact, there was a recent article about the 10 little known facts about blood or something. I forgot which, uh, which side posted, but there was one story about sanguinarians that they mentioned to me a few times. But one of those 10 things was the story you're talking about. I just passed over as soon as I read that it was something to do with uh, legal, uh, legal, recent um, political happenings. It's not just that. So adrenochrome, adrenochrome is a, a term that's referred to as adrenalized blood. So uh, essentially, and, and this is actually a common practice, like um, a lot of people will eat uh, or like either drink adrenalized blood or consume adrenalized meat, you know, like you can, uh, even myself, like, so living in Cincinnati, I I hunt, I like hunting, uh, and it's a great way to provide food for myself. Um, but like 
I remember that, um, for example, w- one year I was, uh, I took a shot at this deer and I, and I didn't hit the deer like in the lung the way that I would want to, because it's a, it's a quick and efficient kill. Um, but right. you know, I, I, I miss shot. I hit it in the stomach. It took the deer a little bit longer to die. All the meanwhile, like the deer adrenaline is pumping through the deer system. Right. Right. right and right. It, it creates a significant, significant flavor difference in the meat. Um, one that I would assume probably is a bit of an acquired taste, but historically speaking that when you put that adrenaline in the meat, that it has kind of a life giving force back to the person. Gotcha. Now I would imagine that there's probably like some occult origins uh, tied to this completely. Like it has to come from right. that kind of stuff, which is, you know, when we talk about like Babylonian and Persian cultures, Egyptian cultures, the, the, the practice of blood consumption at that point in time, probably like you said, was the life force giving to individuals. Mm-hmm. So this idea, and yeah, there was a lot of this tied to the, the talks of like, uh, Epstein and Epstein Island and the adrenochrome and all that kind of like the, basically like the abduction of this as it tied into the pedophilia ring was the abduction of young children and then consuming this adrenalized blood. But nonetheless, this is actually a practice uh, just in, in normal life. Like there are some people that will purposely eat adrenalized meat and stuff like that mm. because they believe that it gives them more energy, almost like, Fascinating. you know, meat on steroids. It's a bad example, really, because we do pump animals full of right. hormones nowadays. So it doesn't right. really get my point across, but you get what I'm saying. So, you know, yeah. I guess ultimately leading to the question, then I'm, I'm assuming now because I'm, you know, educating you on that particular term, you probably haven't come across to this kind of, because this would fall probably more into the sinister version of human vampires or modern day vampires in the sense that right. in order to consume adrenalized blood, much like the story of the young girl walking down the road, you would really mm-hmm. have to be scared for your life in order to create that kind of adrenaline. Right flow when you're extracting the blood um right so i'm assuming that you've not come across to any anything like this but let me ask you this if if, if you are and i'm asking this because i'm really asking you yeah and i'm also thinking it through myself if you're a donor and you like giving your blood and by the way when they when a vampire finds a donor it's not like they're just walking down the street and they see a homeless person say hey you want to make 20 bucks or something like that it's it's a long process and it's and it's a process that involves trust and eventually when they feel like the person might be open to the idea the, the vampires will both have their blood tested uh for various things and they'll you know including stds or whatnot and basically they'll they'll show that they are are safe and that this exchange of blood is uh, as safe as one can possibly be without knowing you know for you know that it's going to be completely safe and uh, when the blood's taken they use either you know they take medical tubing out of a sterile pack, or they take a brand new scalpel that they dispose right afterwards, who knows. But um, if you're a donor, and even though you've done this before, it's, there has to be this rush of excitement when the blood is being taken, especially if you're a blood fetishist. Um, that's probably not going to produce adrenaline or would it? I'll give you a real life example. Um, I, okay. I can't like if you've ever been say like um, for me I've done some stupid stuff uh, you know dr- driving a motorcycle in college and then you know mm-hmm. you're with your buddy and he's like come on let's juice it and suddenly you're doing 150 160 miles an hour down the highway Ooh. on a motorbike right yeah. you got right. like you got some you got some excitement going there but still even though there's like you'll get to a speed like I got to a speed I mean I was I was at 165 on a motorcycle one time God. and at that speed I I got a little scared where I was like where I was like man like I, I you know this is getting above my pay grade um not to right. mention that this is not a smart thing to do and and I was young so I'm in no way shape or form uh condoning the riding of motorcycles really fast out right, of the highway right, right. I am just simply saying that I was dumb enough to do this at at least mm-hmm. one point in my life and right. so but when I hit that speed I was like man I need to back off like this is not a smart thing to do it's a different feeling for example have you ever been driving down the road and like a deer jumps out in front of you on the highway yeah. And, yes, and you know that you know that feeling you get when time slows down um, and mm-hmm. it's like you can like you can check over this shoulder, look in that mirror, look in your rear view, look over there, make sure there's not a car in that lane, almost goes almost go to your right and then decide to go left all within yeah. a millisecond. But it felt like 30 yeah. seconds. It's and almost you, involuntary. Yeah. And you get that tingle in your body like your whole and you're like like it's like I always tell people like that's how you know you're alive. That to me that kind of that kind of true like fear like not you know 
is the kind of, I would imagine like that's the kind of fear you would have to produce in order to gotcha. produce the levels of adrenaline that you could. Because like when I read okay. about people that like when I'm reading about people that, that, that consume uh, adrenochrome or that eat adrenalized meat, you're talking about like m animals that they will terrorize to, okay. and the animals know that they're going to die. Um, you know, obviously right. this is an inhumane practice, but this is something that people do to produce a result for themselves. And so right. much like the deer that I told the story of that when I shot that deer, that deer has to know like I'm dying. And that right. produces a different kind of a level of adrenaline than just simply riding down the, 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 the street on a motorcycle a bit too fast and going, whoa, 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 maybe I should back off. Right. You know, right. both, I'm, right. I'm assuming both probably produce some adrenaline, but at completely different levels, you know? Exactly. So it, it feels like if they did have some adrenaline, this rush to the vampire, um, the person who's having it taken from them, the donor, it's the, 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 the amount adrenaline will be almost to the point of so minute that it's would have little or no bearing on the taste um that makes perfect sense to me the adrenaline obviously as you know is designed to give that body that boost when there is this flight or fight thing going on and something has to happen or you're going to die yeah um so i can't imagine there would be that amount of adrenaline so it's i've never had any of my study participants talk about it or even know that that might be a possibility but even if they did, I don't think, I think even if they did their own research, they would say, I don't think they would produce that kind of thing. Um, but even if there are, my, the vampires are also very, very ethical. They even have this kind of a donor bill of rights they, that they try to, to stick to. And they would never, ever want to frighten someone to the point where the, the blood would taste different. It would be unethical. So I don't, I've never come across it, the, uh, the, the term you're talking about, but I can't imagine if they knew about it, that they would be susceptible to it. That makes sense. Okay, so aside from blood consumption, have you ever met a vegan vampire? I'd have to check my notes. I I might have and just have forgotten it, uh, but I would have to say probably not. There it would be not. a heavy amount of irony in that whole thing, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, I imagine not, but I, I imagine that there are vegan vampires. I mean, there. Are, We've calculated, you know, probably generally speaking, at least 5,000 in the U.S. So I imagine there have to be some vegan vampires in there, despite the fact that they're consuming blood. Um, but yeah, none of the ones I've met have been vegan. As silly as it sounds, I can almost see the reasoning on that because there are people in this world that are vegan, not because they don't enjoy the taste of animal product per se, but they don't want to harm an animal. Um, and so if you have a willing donor, it is a way for me to say, I'm not harming anything and I have willing donors giving me blood. So at least that makes sense. All right. Uh, let me, uh, I, I, I appreciate your time. But, so let me finish out with uh, just a couple of fun questions. Favorite vampire movies. Give me some of your favorite vampire movies and why. Ooh. Well, when, as I said, when I was growing up, I was watching lots of horror movies, but my brothers and my parents could definitely tell that I definitely <laughs> liked vampire movies the most. And uh, my favorite one growing up was by then the most recent Dracula movie, which was the 1979 Universal Dracula Frank Langella. So I really loved that film. Um, but in 1992, when Bram Stoker's Dracula came out, that became my all time favorite vampire and Dracula film. It's a very important Dracula film in terms of Dracula film history. But yeah, my favorite, uh, and you asked about vampire films or just any kind of... Any, any kind of film that, that involves, we'll, say, we'll just, let's stick to a vampire genre. Yeah, so Bram Stoker's Dracula. Um, I liked all the, the 80s greats like uh, um, Lost Boys, even though if I, when I look back now, it's a fairly conservative movie. Uh, the Lost Boys was great. Bram Stoker's Dracula 92 was great. I didn't see The Hunger at the time, but now that I've seen The Hunger years later uh, with David Bowie and Catherine Deneuve, that's a really good vampire film. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Um, in fact, it, what the way they act uh, is something, they don't act like real vampires, but you definitely see a slight tinge of in that film of the real vampire community, which is pretty awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, there's so many great ones. Twilight's not on uh, your list? No, no, it's not. <laughs> I, I was really adverse to it at the time, but I, eventually I found this kind of equilibrium with it where, because... But and that's a really important period that you're talking about. <clears throat> Vampire culture and films and books and whatnot were heading in a very good, positive, progressive direction, as all monster movies were. But I felt like at the time, The Twilight was just this throwback to this period that we were leaving behind, which is, you know, 
very, very conservative vampire representations. Um, but even them, I, then I realized that even it has its merits and it's the way I describe it is it's like the conservatives version of this new modern day progressive vampires. Like in other words, yeah, okay, fine. The vampires don't have to be staked by the end. Fine. As long as they get married first before he bites her, uh, or as long as, you know, the white vampires with the white vampire and the male vampires with the female vampire, all those little things that are happening in that movie. So it's, it's kind of the, the, the version of a vampire film for conservative people where they can say, okay, fine, this can happen as long as they stick to these things. But at the time I was a huge true blood fan because I was living in okay, Louisiana yeah. Yeah, yeah, literally when it was out. And it, there was just, at the time there was just nothing better than true blood. It was all over the place in terms of how, progressive it was and, and free thinking. So wasn't, definitely the True Blood series. Was wasn't the original really vampire awesome. in True Blood, wasn't the original vampire's name Lilith in True Blood? Oh gosh, that's going back to one of the later episodes. She's definitely in it somewhere. I think it was, yeah. Yeah, which is Lilith. which is obviously the callback to the, that because that's the yeah. Hebrew term for the, the demon that was yeah. basically, you know, would come at night and take your blood. Yep. Lilith uh, or Lilith, Lilith to uh, the, the, Looking back in one of the um, older versions of the Bible, I think it's the the uh, the Torah, maybe. Anyway, Lilith was the the first wife of Adam, um, and because she <clears throat> wanted to be in a more dominant position in, in bed with him, and he wasn't having it, he kicked her out of the Garden of Eden, and then their children were killed by God, I think, and she was cursed to become this thing that despised children and that would take blood and such and such. And then, of course, then Adam um, meets Eve. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's uh, a spinoff version of the uh, the story of of a Lilith. Um, what about movies like uh, I Am Legend? I love I Am Legend. That wasn't a vampire adaption. What, what? It's uh, yes, it's. Um, I've written a lot on zombies too, and I love I Am Legend because I describe those vampires as vampire zombies or zombie vampires there's they're vampires but i like to call them zombie vampires and they look they're more akin to the folkloric vampire the vampire people believed in and would go stake so they <clears throat> that's very important in terms of, of matheson's contribution um but th his contribution more than that though is that his the behavior of his vampires and the behavior of the lone survivor really influenced later zombie cinema so even though that's a vampire book, uh, it influenced zombie more than it did vampires. Um, but I like his his book very, very much, very, very much, because it take it goes back to the folkloric vampire. And it kind of redefines the the kind of the vampire that people were used to at that point. Yeah, I, I I when I was reading some of your research articles, I kind of I drifted down, I, I decided to keep our conversation pretty much uh you know focused on vampires because if we if we would have gone on the zombie path too we would have been all over the place yeah. i would but i'll just ask you out of curiosity your um your favorite what is um what what is your favorite uh zombie zombie show film um if you had to pick gosh, one gosh well i definitely love the original dawn of the dead it's a lot of fun and to this day i'll put it on for background ambiance while i'm working on some piece just because I can hear basic bits of the dialogue. I know exactly where in the film it is. Uh, so anything that Romero did is obviously a big favorite of mine. Well, listen, John, hey, I appreciate you coming on. Um, anybody listening, where can they get a hold of uh, your articles, your books, things things of that nature, get a hold of you and all that kind of stuff? Well, I have uh, my Academia EDU site. It's probably the best thing. And if they just Google my full name, John Edgar Browning, that's one of the first sites that pops up. And that's a yeah. place where I try to archive as much of my stuff as possible. So they have access to a lot of it for free, except for the whole books. Yeah. But even then I put fairly large or lengthy excerpts on there. Yeah, there are. There's a, uh, you know, when I was planning on bringing you on, I spent a lot of time actually on that website and reading just a lot of the excerpts and stuff. It was quite uh, educational and entertaining, man. So uh, it is, yeah, it's f fun, fun read. And I appreciate you coming on. I had, had a great conversation and uh, yeah, fun conversation. Yeah. Let me know if I should come back and we can talk about zombies. That's actually not a bad, not a bad idea. I'll, I'll take, I'll take some time to put some space okay. in between these episodes, but we'll come back on Thanks. and we'll, We'll, uh, we'll do okay. a little zombie talk. All right. Awesome, Sounds terrific. Man. Thanks a lot. Quite Franklin is providing this podcast as a public service, but it is neither a legal interpretation nor legal advice, nor a statement of Quite Franklin policy. 
Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation of that product or entity by Rich Franklin or Quite Franklin. The views expressed by guests on the podcast are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Views and opinions expressed by Quite Franklin employees or representatives are the views and opinions of the persons expressing them, and do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of Quite Franklin or any of its officials or principals. Nothing heard on this podcast at any time is medical advice or is intended as medical advice. The listener must always consult his or her personal physician or other qualified medical professional regarding any questions of a medical nature. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact our general counsel.